All right, what's up, everybody? We're back with another edition of Everyday Hoops. Hope you guys are having a good one. Today, we're going to be talking about every series after one game. Game ones were this weekend. They were very exciting to watch. I'm going to be recapping all the game ones, talk about each series now that we are we have started them. So we're going to get into that. Uh, thank you guys for the views on the videos and the shorts recently. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the content around here, consider subscribing, like, turn notifications, do all stuff like that. I'd really appreciate it. Really upset a lot. Uh, join the membership. If you want to learn more about the membership, there's a video on my channel explaining all of it. You can go back and watch that. Link to my Twitter, TikTok, stuff like that in the description down below. And uh, yeah, don't waste any more of your time. Let's get right into it. So we're going to order by game. Um, the first game we had was the Cavaliers and the Magic. The Cavaliers end up winning that game 97 to 83. They take a 1-0 series lead at home. Um, takeaways from this game. Uh, the Cavaliers got off to a great start shooting. They hit their first five three-pointers. And then it was, from, from then on, they went three for 25 for the rest of the game from three. They had that little advantage at the start. But, yeah, it was a very gritty type of game, which is what we all expected, kind of what I said in my playoff preview video. Don't expect this to be a high-scoring, sparks flying, like offensive sparks like type of series. It's going to be a defensive series, and whoever really is going to be able to hit the three ball well is going to win this one, and the Cavaliers were the one today. They shot eight for 30. Well, the Magic were 8 for 37. Um, yeah, very physical as well. Got some going back and forth. Mo Wagner making some things. George Niang, Markel Fultz. Got some some fireworks, some sparks in this series, which will probably make it better. You know, the Cavaliers last year, you know, were the Knicks just basically bullied them for the entire series. Now the Cavs come back, and they establish it early, of just like the aggressiveness and just like, hey, we're here. We're not going to get bullied anymore, which is a huge thing for this team. You know, bring some toughness to it which is why they brought in guys like Max Schuess, George Niang, guys that have been around this before, you know? But, yeah, um, Donald Mitchell dropped 30, shot 11 for 21. Um, the fatigue hit a little bit, but at the end of the day, he was doing really good things. At the end of the day, hitting big shots the Cavs need. The bigs also were big in this game. In the first half, especially Evan Mobley and Jared Allen both had double-doubles. Mobley had 16 and 11. He had a couple threes. Jared Allen had 16 and 18. Um, I think the bigs... Getting going was big for the Cavaliers as well. For the Magic, uh, Paolo had 24, 7, and 5, shot 9 for 17. He did have 9 turnovers in this game, though. Uh, again, the three ball wasn't really falling. You know, it's outside of Paolo, they couldn't really get anybody else going. Franz Wagner was 7 for 15. Jalen Suggs was 4 for 16. Gear Harris didn't score in 33 minutes. You know, um, Mo Mar Wagner had 10, but besides that, no one else on the bench really did much either. You know, Cole Anthony went 0 for 7. Markel Fultz went 0 for 4. And, yeah, just the spacing issues of the Magic really showed, you know. We knew the Magic weren't a like, high-powered offense, spacey type of team. They're going to have to win these games, uh, forcing turnovers, being gritty, and then hoping someone can hit some shots, you know. But the Cavaliers ultimately win game one. Uh, I think adjustments for game two uh, for the Cavaliers, they kind of got lucky in a sense because the Magic really could have had this game early in the third quarter. Early in the third quarter, Jalen Suggs is bringing energy, and the Magic had a huge chance to take this lead and potentially could have took this game. You know, it took a lot of momentum, but with the spacing issues, you know, they got a lot of open shots from guys like Jalen Suggs and Franz Wagner, Gary Harris, couldn't convert. And then what ended up, it was a three-point game, I think, I want to say, and the Magic could have took their lead, but instead, Davin Mitchell started hitting a couple shots. They were down 10, and from then on, the Magic just couldn't really find anything, you know. So the Magic need to take advantage of those runs when they have, when the Cavs are missing and they are forcing turnovers. They need to get out in transition, hit some quick shots. I think a big thing for the Magic, though, is they need their guards. They need their guards to do something. You know, like, like Gary Harris, Jalen Suggs, Markel Fultz, and Cole Anthony. You know, they're four guards. They want to combine four for 33 from the field. Four for 33 combined for 17 points. Jalen Suggs was four for 16. Gary Harris was 0 for 6. Markel Fultz was 0 for 4. Cole Anthony was 0 for 7. That cannot happen. Your guards cannot shoot four for 33 combined. That, that's that's insane. You, you can't have that. You need them to do, not saying they all need to score 30, but they need you need something from them. They're the guys that have the ball in their hands. They're the guys that bring energy, especially Suggs and Harris on the defensive end. And if you can get a little bit of contribution from offense, Jalen Suggs is an amazing three-point shooter. Gary Harris is a good three-point shooter. Markel and Cole Anthony aren't three-point shooters, but both those guys can get to the rim and create offense not only for themselves but for others. They really need their guards to step up and do things. You know, if their guards can't get it going or anything, it's going to be it just puts more on Paolo to do more scoring and facilitating, you know. So, yeah, the Magic need their guards for something for the Cavaliers. Um, their offense just stalls out sometimes, you know, and I think they just can't have that. 
you know, especially with a gritty type of magic team that forces turnovers and like to get out of transition and like to get to the free throw line and get some easy ones. The Cavaliers, they start off hot from three, but they got really, really cold. You know, they only were really saved because the Magic couldn't hit any shots either. You know, so I think if the Cavaliers, I think a big thing for the Cavaliers for this series, if they want to win it, play with a lead. If you could play with a consistent seven, eight, nine point lead, the Magic don't have the offensive firepower to make that up that like quick. You know, so I think for the Cavaliers, they can continue to play with a nine, ten point lead and force the Magic to kind of force the Magic to shoot threes, force the Magic to kind of play catch up. You know, I think that'll work really good for the Cavs. But yeah, I still think there's gonna be a gritty, grinded out series that I'm gonna like. You know, but game one, Cavaliers took that one. Next we'll go Suns, Timberwolves, 3-6. The Timberwolves end up winning this game 120-95, to 95, a 25-point lead, 25-point win. Uh, it was a really good first half, and then the, the second and third quarter, Minnesota outscored Phoenix 34-23 in the third, second, 31-21 in the third. Anthony Edwards had 20 in the third quarter, and from then on, Phoenix just couldn't come back. Minnesota ends up getting the win. Anthony Edwards, 33-9-6 on 14 for 24 shooting, took over in that third quarter. Just an electric moment right there, you know what I mean? And, yeah, just him showing, you know, during the regular season, it's been said a lot. He struggled with the Suns. He only averaged about 14 a game against the Suns in the regular season. But we knew that wasn't going to have to stay that like that for that long. And Anthony Edwards came out, especially in that third quarter, and just absolutely dominated on the offensive end. Also, for Minnesota, it just showed the role player difference. I think that was a big thing, the role players for Minnesota for Phoenix. For Minnesota, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, 18 points, 4 steals, 4 three-pointers. That was huge. Nas Reed, 12 points off the bench. You know, Jay McDaniels was playing really good on the defensive end. You know, so I think the role player did. For Phoenix, they didn't really get that much from the role players. You know, Grayson Allen didn't make a shot in 25 minutes. Royce O'Neal hit a couple three-pointers. Nurkic had just nine points and four rebounds. Eric Gordon didn't score in 21 minutes. Drew Eubanks didn't score in nine minutes. So just the role player difference, I think, is was a big factor in me picking the Timbos in this series was the fact that I liked the Timbos role players and stuff better, and I didn't trust the Suns role players, and it showed in game one. You know, Kofi Towns also had 19 points, seven rebounds, shot five for nine, you know. Wasn't super, super aggressive, but when he needed to hit shots, he hit shots, and he got to the free throw line a lot as well. So having that is big. Uh, didn't get a good Mike Conley game, though. He only shot 2 for 12, had a couple bad fouls and turnovers, which is a rare my, bad, like not a high IQ Mike Conley game. But, you know, I assume it gets better. Rudy Gobert also had a double-double. But, yeah, Minnesota, that second and third quarter really just established the energy. You know, they established the energy. They got their offense going with Anthony Edwards. Again, guys like Nikhil, Nazareed, bringing some offensive intensity as well. Those guys, I mean, the kid was a plus 28, now Cerritos a plus 22. Having those guys come in and consistently give effort, you know, it's going to be huge, especially against a Suns team that doesn't really have that from their bench, you know. And for Phoenix, uh, it was honestly, it was interesting seeing the Minnesota Timberwolves defensive game plan early in this game. Early in the game, well, throughout most parts of the game, when it was the starters, when Beal, Booker, and KD were out on the court. Instead of Jamie McDaniels guarding KD, Jamie McDaniels was guarding Devin Booker. Jane McDaniels was guarding Devin Booker. Uh, they had, I think, Anthony Edwards on Bradley Beal. And then they just had whoever else on Kevin Durant. They had Conthony Towns on Kevin Durant. And they were switching, and they were just allowing KD to go one-on-one with Rudy Gobert, with Conthony Towns, right? whoever was out there. When Beal and Booker were out there, McDaniels was guarding Booker, and they were just letting whoever guard Kevin Durant and say, you know what, KD, go ahead and win. Like, it looked like they were saying, you know what, KD, go ahead. You're going to have to score 50 to beat us. You know, kind of a similar strategy to what the Bucks did back in 2021 when he was with the Nets, where game five, six, and seven, they were like, you know what? Kyrie's hurt. Harden's not 100%. KD, you're going to have to beat us by yourself. You're going to have to put up 40 and 50 to beat us. And the, he almost did. He almost did. He was a, you know, a shoe size away. But it's interesting seeing that. And I kind of, it makes sense because Devin Booker and Bradley Beal are the lead ball handlers of the Suns. And they're the guys that don't not only get themselves involved, but they also they get the Grayson Allens, the Nurkic's, the Doris O'Neal's. They get those guys involved as well with driving, kicking, you know, passing. I mean, Devin Booker, career high in assists. He averaged seven assists per game. Bradley Beal also played point, a lot of point guard duty as well when he was there. So I think they were like, you know what? We're going to shut the main ball handlers down and force them, you know, shut them down so that we don't have anybody else score. And you know what? They have so many good scores. KD's going to be the one. We're just going to let KD do his thing, but we're not going to let Devin Booker and Bradley Beal do their thing. And Devin Booker had a very bad game, 5 for 16, 2 for 6 and 3, 5 assists, 1 turnover, 4 fouls, 18 points. You know, he had a tough game. Jane McDaniels is making his life not not easy, you know. So, yeah, I'm interested to see how the Suns counteract that, if they maybe put Devin Booker in more actions or whatever, or if Devin Booker can kind of, you know, find himself. You know, I'm not expecting him to shoot 5 for 16 
every game. But with Jaden McDaniels on him, it's going to be really tough. But the Suns just need more from the role players, man. I mean, Grayson Allen was the lead leader in three point percent. He just got a new contract. He can't shoot an offer, you know. And he did get injured in this game as well. So we don't really know what his status is for game two. I haven't checked. Um, but if they lose him, that's going to be huge, you know. Royce O'Neal did his thing, but yeah, Eric Gordon twenty one minutes, zero for five. Drew Eubanks nine minutes, didn't do anything really. So yeah, they just can't afford that, especially against Minnesota Timberwolves team that has the role players like Nikhil, like Nas Reed, like Jaden McDaniels, who are always gonna do something, you know, on either end. So I think yeah, the Tim Suns need their role players to really step up, but they also need Devin Booker. They need Devin Booker to come in, and they need Devin Booker to be aggressive and do his thing. But Minnesota takes game one. Very interesting to see how the Suns counter come back. Next, we had Knicks and Sixers. The Knicks ended up winning game one, 111 to 104, the seven point win for New York. A uh, very interesting game. You know, the Sixers got off to an amazing start. Joel B was dominant in the first quarter. Then Joel sits. The Knicks start their run with Miles McBride, Bogdanovich, Josh Harbour, and Energy. Joel B comes back into the game. Joel B gets hurt again with a knee after a self lob dunk. Comes down, read out his knee. You know, Sixers don't have a great end to the half. But then. Joel comes back in the third quarter. The Sixers outscore the Knicks 36-21 in the third quarter. But then the Knicks come back. Josh Hart makes some huge plays in the fourth. Miles McBride hits some huge shots. You know, OG's defense in them. And the Knicks end up coming back and winning this game. It was a very back-and-forth, back-and-forth, back-and-forth game of runs in this one. Uh, for the Knicks, Jalen Brunson was only 8 for 26, 1 for 6 and 3, 5 turnovers. Didn't have a great game. Still had 22-7-7. Seven and seven, But a bad shooting night. You know, and the Sixers were playing really good. Tyrus Maxey, honestly, was guarding Jalen Brunson a lot. And he was doing his thing. You know, so shout out to Tyrese Maxey. Just got a report right before making this video said he might not play tonight with illness, um, which that would suck a whole lot. But yeah, Jalen Brunson had a tough game, but it was others. Josh Hart, 22, 13, four three pointers. He had a huge, like, fading three to kind of seal the game. Like, he was just showing what Josh Hart does, you know, making big plays happen. Miles McBride, though, man, shout out to Deuce. Deuce McBride, 21 points, five threes, a plus 37. Being a plus 37 in a game that was only a 7-point win is ridiculous. <laughs> like, that's ridiculous, man. He was hitting so many big shots when they needed him to. Like, he, he was just doing it all there. And then Bogdanovich as well. Bogdanovich has not had a great Knicks time so far, but he showed up last night 13-7. and seven. He was a plus 27. The bench for the Knicks, really. I mean, Mitchell Robinson is too. Mitchell Robinson had 12 rebounds, 4 blocks, playing good defense on Joel. He was a plus 20. You no, know, so the bench... That's crazy. You look at the plus minus. All five starters for the Knicks was a minus plus minus. The entire Knicks bench was a plus plus minus. So having your role players come in and do that was amazing, especially when your star player Jalen Brunson is struggling to shoot from the field. But yeah, the Knicks was hot. But for the really the focus on the Sixers is Joel Embiid. You know he came back. We course we saw in the playing game against Miami he didn't look like the best condition wise. Uh, he came out early in this game was dominant and then he got injured. Came back. He only shot 8 for 22. He was 11 for 12 in the free throw line. He had 29 and 6, or 29, 8 and 6. But yeah, really the focus is going to be on Joel's conditioning and his health, which has been every playoff series he's played in, that's been the one question with Joel. It's like, is he healthy? How much is he healthy? How is his conditioning? You know, because if he's still lingering with injuries and stuff like that, it's going to be really hard for the Six to win. Uh, good thing is they did get Tyrus Maxey have a good game, 33 points. You know, Kyle Lowry had a great game as well with four threes. You know, uh, just didn't really get help from anyone else. You know, Kelly Oubre was only 3 for 7. Uh, Tobias had a bad game, 7 points, 3 for 7. The bench didn't provide anything, really. Nick Batum was 1 for 4. Paul Reed had 4 points. Buddy Hill didn't score. Cameron Payne didn't score. Um, yeah, the bench didn't provide anything. The role players didn't. And so, the, yeah, they need they need Tobias Harris. They need Tobias Harris, man. I think Tobias Harris is a big X factor for the Sixers um, playoff. Besides Joel Embiid's injury, health, obviously, it's Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris is supposed to be the third guy, you know, where if Joel and Tyrese got it going, Tyrese, I mean, Tobias doing the little things, hitting big shots, you know, playing good defense is their big thing. And if Tobias can't get it going, then it's going to be hard for the Sixers to win, you know. But yeah, really the whole, you know, concern and the big microscope on the series is going to be how is Joel and B performing, you know, how healthy is he, how is his conditioning right now. But I think this, this is going to be an interesting series, man, you know, with Joel playing and being there, you know, it's going to be very interesting. Joel just has to dominate the entire game, not just the first quarter. You know, but yeah, and the Sixers need some help from everyone else. But for the Knicks, uh, Jalen Brunson, you know, he's got to shoot better, obviously. Um, 
But if their bench can keep doing what their bench has been doing and providing the energy that they have been, man, that's going to be huge for the Knicks. Now we got Nuggets, Lakers. The Nuggets end up winning game one, 114-103. Very tight game. Lakers got off to a great start. You know, we're leading for most of the half. The Nuggets came back at the end of the second quarter. And in the third quarter, the Nuggets outscored the Lakers 32-18. And the Lakers just couldn't really find their way back. You know, um, yeah, honestly, I knew this game was over. And the Nuggets were winning. When they were the last few minutes of the half, the Lakers were up but most of the half by like nine, by like double digits-ish, you know, in that range. Yet, KCP, I don't think he scored in the first half. Jamal Murray had a bad shooting night. Michael Porter Jr. wasn't really doing much in the first half. Aaron Gordon was in foul trouble. You know, the bench wasn't doing much. Like, nothing. I felt like nothing was going the Nuggets' way. Yet, the Lakers only had a halftime lead because LeBron hit a logo three. Like, if you get that type of half from the Nuggets, you have to capitalize. Against a team like the Denver Nuggets, any little mistake they make, any little thing that they're not doing well, you have to jump on it and capitalize it. You know, and if you don't, the Nuggets are going to find a way to come back and win. And that's when as soon as halftime hit, and LeBron hit that logo three, and it was only a three-point game, I said, it's a, Nuggets are winning this game. The Nuggets are winning this game. Because no way they're going to get an offer for KCP. No way Jamal Murray's going to shoot this bad. No way no one else is going to impact. And we get to the third quarter. And Jamal Murray starts hitting shots, KCP starts hitting shots, MPJ starts hitting shots, and now it's like, well, it's over now. You know, Jokic finished with 32, 12, and 7 on 15 for 23 shooting, just being Jokic, doing Jokic things. Jamal Murray also had a great game, 22, 6, and 10, even though he didn't have a great shooting night. He hit some big shots when it mattered, you know, especially in the second half. MPJ, 19 and 8, he was kind of a big component to them starting their run. You know, it was him getting offensive rebounds, hitting shots, um, he hit three threes, eight field goals. So him doing that, KCP in the fourth quarter, have four three, well, have four threes in the second half. Aaron Gorin, 12, 11, and 7. You know, he was in early foul trouble, but he came back, and the Nuggets end up winning this game. You know, um, DeAndre Jordan is playing minutes in this series, which that that's a choice that has been made. Um, but yeah, Payne Watson was good early. He had eight points at two threes, but didn't really do much throughout the rest of the game. But for the Lakers, that's a tough one, because if the Lakers wanted a chance, that was the game. that was the game right there. I think everybody in the league knows that was the game. Even LeBron, even the Lakers know that was the game. Taking game, coming in, having that hot start, having the Nuggets not really, you know, look as sharp as they usually do. Stealing, taking game one in Denver, taking the series lead was going to be a hu so huge for them. And they fumble it. You know, AD had a good game too. 32, 14, 5, and 4 blocks. You know, didn't shoot crazy well. It was over 4 from 3. But he was doing everything else well. LeBron, 27, 6, and 8. 10 for 16. After that, D'Lo, 6 for 20, 1 for 9 from 3. Austin Reeves, 2 for 6 and 3. You know, we had, I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even realize where Echimura was playing. Like, there was a point, it was only until like the third quarter where he grabbed a rebound. I was like, oh, wait, where Echimura was out there? Like, I didn't notice him at all. Torian Prince had 11, but after that, Spencer didn't when he gave Vincent and Jackson Hayes. Spencer didn't when he played 13 minutes, gave Vincent played 7 minutes, Jackson Hayes played 4 minutes. None of those three attempted a shot. Those three guys didn't even attempt a shot in this game, you know. So the Lakers, a big thing with the Lakers was they need their others every single night to perform. And they didn't get it. They didn't get it in this game. You know, at, beside LeBron and AD, no one else really did much. You know, Austin, again, D Deal had a bad shoot tonight. Austin Reeves wasn't really aggressive that much. You know, Rory Hachimura was kind of just out there. The bench, beside Torian Prince, no one else was even shooting the ball. So the Lakers need their others. I mean, that's a thing that's been said so much time. But the Lakers need D'Lo. They can't have D'Lo can't go one for nine from three. You know, Austin Reeves can't go two for six. Rachimura can't just be out there. Like they need those guys need to make an impact on the court. And if they don't, the Nuggets are gonna run through them. You know. But this was this was the game for the Lakers. This was the game. If they ever wanted to take this series, this was the game. Game one, Nuggets had a bad shooting start. You know, having LeBron AD have the performances they had, like game one to take the series lead, that was the game. You know, but for the Lakers, they need their others, really. And the Nuggets, don't really count on the Nuggets, you know, having bad first halves all the time, you know. And now we go into yesterday's games. First, it starts Celtics Heat, game one. Celtics win this game by 20. Um, Celtics got off to a blistering hot start. I think they were up like 17 to 4 at some point. The Heat did make it a game, though. The Heat definitely came back. You know, grit and grind their way back into a game. Celtics started missing their shots. And then, you know, the Celtics started hitting their shots in the middle of the second quarter. And then we got to the third, and it was like, okay, it's over. 
they outscored Miami 31-14. Um, the Heat made it like a fake comeback, made it like a 14-point game in the fourth quarter, but nothing really too serious. And then Celtics had a winning this one. Uh, Jason Tatum was amazing in this game. Jason Tatum, 23-10-10, finished with a triple-double, even though he only shot 7 for 18, 1 for 8 from 3. His playmaking was just on display. You know, he's been... I credit Jason Tatum a lot this season for buying into his role, in a sense, of just saying, like, you know what? He averaged, he averaged 30 a game last year and really could be in the MVP conversation if he really wanted to go out and do it. But he was like, you know what? I got this teammates now. I'm going to step back. I'm going to develop my game, you know, to be able to make plays for others as well. And he did that. Last night was just the perfect example. You know, he was so many times where he could have went one-on-one, could have done that, but he's like, you know what? I'm going to take this extra trouble. I'm going to do this. And then, boom, I have Sam Howell in the corner. I'm going to have Derek White in the wing. I'm going to have Drew Holly, like, just making plays for everybody else. You know, that was huge. Derek White hit four three-pointers. He had 20 points. Everybody that played for the Celtics hit a three. He shot 22 for 49 from three. Uh, everybody, everybody, besides Jason Tatum, hit multiple threes. You know, Chris Hauser, Derek White, Sam Hauser, all hit four threes. Jalen Brown hit three. Drew Holiday, Al Wolfer, Payton Pritchard hit two, and Tatum hit one. You know, the three ball was dominant, like it's always been. Chris Hauser, you know, doing his thing. You know, he's, I mean, the Celtics are already good as a team, obviously. But I think Chris Hauser, makes this team the best. Chris Hauser, makes this team the number one. You know, just the way he could do, like you saw last night, he was a mismatch. You know, he's no no one really can match up with him often. You know what I mean? Like the three balls he was hitting, the getting him in the post, that little mid-range shot, he knocks it down all the time. Defensively, he was there as well. Just having that there was not big. And then the bench, too. Sam Hauser in that second quarter with a couple threes was just huge as well. But, yeah, Boston just hitting their threes, doing their thing, you know, just being the Boston Celtics. You know, then Miami, um, they were in this game a little bit. They had some stretches, you know. They had the defense, the stretches, playing physical with the Celtics, you know, like having, getting them into a grit and grind, physical, like dogfight type of game is their way. It's just they they cannot score consistently, especially when Tyler Hero was four for thirteen. He had a bad night, you know. Bam was aggressive to early, was aggressive in the first quarter, then didn't shoot again until the fourth quarter when they were already down twenty two, you know. So Bam finished with twenty four, but he didn't really do much until the fourth quarter, and he he's got to be aggressive every time he's on the court, you know. And when he came out early and hit a couple shots on Chris Hops, I was like, oh shoot, here here's the Bam, he's the Bam we all were waiting for. And then that went away. So Bam Bam needs to be aggressive all the time. You know, Jaime Akez was doing much he could. 16 points. Jovic hit a couple threes in that you know, second half. DeLon Wright hit five threes in the fourth quarter. You know, Kevin Love hit a couple shots. So yeah, it's just they don't have enough offense to survive, man. That's really what it is. Like, the only way they really have a chance in this series is if Tyler Hero is hitting, Bam is aggressive, and they just got to hope the Celtics miss some threes sometimes. Because they, they don't have the offense to survive. Like they made like again that mid, that end of first quarter early second quarter it was like oh shoot Miami's in this game, you know like Miami's in there they're scrapping they're forcing turnovers they're forcing the Celtics to play to miss shots, like they're getting to the rim trying to drive and kick, but then it's just like dang they just go on so many cold spells offensively especially I mean even with Jimmy and Terry Rozier it's gonna be hard with the offensive spells now without Jimmy and Terry Rozier it's like man that's that's like forty forty five points right there, that that even maybe even more some nights. That you're just missing. So, yeah, it's just hard for this Heat team right now to just keep up offensively with this Boston Celtics team. Next, we got Clippers Mavericks. Clippers end up winning game one, 109-97. Uh, Clippers are on them early. The, the energy was there from the get-go for the Clippers. And that was something they were saying on the broadcast that Ty Lue was saying to his team, saying, we got to get out to a early start. Got to get off to a great start. Can't just ease into it. We got to come out. It hit them in the mouth early. And, boy, did they do that. They hit them in the mouth early. First quarter, and then the second quarter. Mavericks score, we score only eight points in a quarter. <laughs> it is destined for not great. You know, and the Clippers took advantage in the second quarter. And then the third quarter, Mavericks did make it a little bit of an interesting game in the comeback with Kyrie and Lucas starting to get going. But the Clippers just had too much, and they ended up winning. Uh, Paul George, 22. But James Harden, shout out to James Harden. Because without Kawhi in this game, one big thing like was going to be and I said, and a lot of people sure have said, is that James Harden needs to come out. James Harden has more on his plate now. James Harden has more on his plate. He needs to be the number two. He needs to score. And says he needs to do all the things. And it's just like, how much can we really trust him to do that? And he did it. 28-8, six threes, aggressive, 
Like, you needed that. Him and Westbrook were just, it looked like 2014 again. Or not even 2012. 2012. It looked like 2012 again with Harden and Westbrook. Both of those guys were out there just balling. Westbrook had 13 off the bench. He had a couple three-pointers, bringing energy. He had, he had a nice lob dunk. You know, like, that was nice to see. Paul George at 22 points. Hit so many tough shots, especially in the fourth quarter in this game, that were just like, well, yep, it's over when he hit those shots. Uh, Zubac had a great game, 20 and 15. You know, they established him really early, established the inside game, you know, to kind of force the Mavericks to kind of look in, you know, and sh just exposing the Mavericks' size a little bit. But Zubac getting off to a great start was big. Terrence Mann also was 3-for-3 three three from 3. He had 9 rebounds of 13 points. So, yeah, the, South, the Clippers just came out with uh, energy. You know, they came out with energy. Their defense as well. Really impressed with their defense, especially in the first half. Like, they were making Luka and Kyrie uncomfortable, kind of forcing Derrick Jones and you know, Maxi Kleba and Dante Exum to drive, force them to dribble, force them to drive, force them to make a play. You know, and they was working really well. So, yeah, the Clippers came out with the energy, with the aggression, punched them in the mouth first. Without Kawhi Leonard, that's huge as well. Game one without Kawhi, no, not gonna have Kawhi saying like, "Nah, we're good, we're good still." Like, don't don't worry about us, we're still good. Was big, and now I'm very excited for game two now because I really want to see how much can the Clippers take from this game and how much the energy transforms into the second game because this happened with James Harden last year with the Sixers where he put up 40 in game one, did nothing in game two. So I'm very interested to see how this Clippers team takes it into Game 2, assuming Kawhi is not playing in that game either, you know. But I I, I really want to see the energy in Game 2. And then for the Mavericks, just got off to a bad start, honestly. Got off to a bad start. You score eight points in a quarter, just really hard to come back. You know, had a rare, bad Luka Knight shooting, 11 for 26, 4 for 12 from 3. You know, didn't really get much from anyone else. You know, P.J. Washington was 4 for 10. Daniel Gafford only hit one shot, only played 14 minutes. Derek Jones Jr. didn't make a shot. The bench didn't do anything. Like, you know, so, like, they need the Mavericks. Of course, obviously, they need their others. Like, they need, they brought in Gafford and Washington and them for a reason, you know, is to contribute. And if they can't contribute, then it's going to be really hard, especially against this Clipper team, you know. But I'm not expecting Luka to have 11 for 26 and bad, 1 for 7 from 3 shooting nights often in this series, you know. Kyrie was amazing as well, especially in the second half, but he just needs to get it going early. You know, he just needs to get it going early from the get-go and not in the third quarter when you're down 22. But, yeah, uh, this series is still going to be really good. You know, I just really, su I honestly, surprised and applaud the Clippers for coming out game one and just punch them in the mouth early. You know what I mean? Next, we have Bucks pacers The Bucks end up winning game one, 109-94. to uh, Bucks absolutely dominated this game. Second quarter, Milwaukee outscored Indiana 39-21. Um, Damian Lillard was just insane. 35 points, scored all of them in the first half. 6 for 11 from 3. Didn't score in the second half, but it didn't matter. You know, and of course, without Giannis, I picked the Pacers in this series to win without Giannis. Um, I was gonna, I was saying, the Bucks to win, Dave Miller needs to be the best player on the, in the series, and they need contributions from Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez. And that all that happened. Dave Miller was the best player on the court. Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez contributed. And they got the win. You know, Dame just turning into, like, showing his superpowers. Chris Middleton, 23 and 10 on 9 for 14 shooting. Brooke Lopez had three blocks. You know, Bobby Portis had 15 and 11. You know, Patrick Beverly, seven rebounds, eight assists. You know, Mingle Beasley hit a couple three-pointers. So, yeah, they, the Bucks contributed, you know. And their defense was solid. Their defense was solid, but their offense, moved, they were moving the ball around really well. They were moving the ball around, getting everybody involved. Chris Middleton, Dane getting touches. Malik Beasley getting shots. Bobby Portis getting his shots in the mirror. Like, they look like a balanced, good running offense in this one, which is very big. You know, and to get this game won was huge, I think. She kind of similar to what I said about the Clippers. Have, not having Giannis for potentially who knows how long to come out in game one on your home court and saying, nah, like, this isn't going to be like that. You know, we might, have, we might not have Giannis, but we, we still, we're still like that. And having Dame come out and have that performance in the first half just gives so much confidence to this Bucks team. You know, for Indiana, the inexperience showed. The inexperience and being young and not having much, yeah, play experience showed in this game. You know, they just felt like you know, and the Bucks did a good job as well of not turning the ball over and scoring consistently because Indiana, we know Indiana is the type of team where they feed off that. Like, get a turnover, get a missed shot, let's go. Push the pace, let's go, let's go get an easy bucket. You know, that's what they do. And so forcing Indiana to kind of slow down and play in the half court was big. And you saw when they play in the half court, they're not as good. You know, they did have Pascal, which is something I said in the playoff preview. I said, I said, having Pascal is going to 
prove huge in this series because having a guy that can score in the half court was doing it. Pascal was really the only guy scoring. He had 36 and 13, you know? So, yeah, having Pascal is going to be huge. But, yeah, Indiana just – they also just couldn't buy a three ball, man. I mean, besides – like, the team shot 8 for 39 from three, 20, that's 20%. Like, that, that's just not good as well. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton only took seven shots in this game, nine points. Um, was aggressive early, then just stopped taking shots, and they, they need Tyrese to shoot the ball. You know, they need Tyrese to shoot the ball. No, he hasn't been great the last couple months in terms of shooting, but they, they need him to shoot the ball. You know, uh, Miles Turner was Miles Turner was aggressive. He was 5 for 17. You know, they're letting Miles Turner do his thing. But yeah, Adrian Emhart, 2 for 6. Aaron Neesmith, 2 for 9. You know, TJ McConnell was 5 for 13. Bobby Portis, 2 for 6. GM Smith, 0 for 2. Ben Shepard, 1 for 5. Doug McDermott, 0 for 1. Yeah, just didn't really get contributions besides Pascal Siakam. Really. So Indiana, yeah, they just need to need to find a way to force turnovers. Need to find a way to force turnovers and to get out and run because that's where they're the best at. Getting turnovers, getting out of transition and running. But also, they just need to knock down shots. Like, they shot you for 39. Most of, a lot of their threes were good shots. Like, a lot of their threes were like open Aaron Neesmith shots or open Ben Shepard corner threes or something. They just weren't going down. You know, so if they just make a couple more, this is a lot more interesting in the game. But yeah, Milwaukee getting a huge game one win and having Dame have that performance early was, was big. And then we get the final game, Thunder Pelicans. Who knew that an 8-1, a 1-8 game would be the best game of the night? Or the best game of the first round, honestly. And that was Thunder Pelicans. You know, it was a gritty, grinded out game. You know, not high scoring. Both teams couldn't buy threes. You know, a couple, a lot of turnovers. But the Thunder ended up getting the win 94-92. Thanks to Shea Gilles Alexander. He had 28 points, shot 11 for 24. Um, hit big shots in the matter, you know, just in the clutch, just was smooth, calm, cool, collected, and hit big shots. He had that and one on CJ that was just like, dang, like, that's a tough one. You know, he hit that J-Dub as well, 19-7, didn't have a great shooting night, but his shots in the matter. Chet Holm ran 15-11 in five blocks. He had a huge block, um, to lead, to lead to that Shea bucket, you know, uh, and I want to say, was it CJ McCollum? I don't remember who exactly it was on, but he had a huge block in that one, but yeah. Um, this, yeah, this is a grinded out type of game, you know, and the Thunder usually are like a high power offense type of team, everyone getting involved, it wasn't like that today, you know, team, guys are missing their shots, you know, threes weren't really falling, they shot 10 for 32 from three, you know, they had 13 turnovers in this game as well, uh, the rebounding, the Pel, they were, couldn't grab an offensive rebound, you know, the Pelicans had like four chances on their last possession, well, second to last possession, you know, to get shots, and they just couldn't make them pay, but yeah, OKC's gotta get better on the rebounding. They have been one of the worst rebounding teams in the league, but they got to find a way to, you know, to, to do better. Um, but also, they just got to hit their shots, too. You know, like the three ball wasn't falling. Josh Giddy only hit one shot. He only played 20 minutes. He wasn't that good in this game. Lou Dor hit a couple big shots. You know, but he needs to be better. J-Dub was one for five from three. Isaiah Joe was one for three. You know, their bench didn't provide as much as they usually do, you know. But I think this is going to this, this be an interesting series. You know, this is going to be an interesting series. The Pelicans had some strategies and had some things that were working. You know, uh, CJ had a, a better game. Trey Murphy hit a couple big shots. The bench was still doing the bench things. You know, John Chunis having 20 rebounds is huge. Getting He had nine offensive rebounds in this game. You know, even Larry Nance had four offensive rebounds in this game. That's huge as well. But also, they, they also couldn't buy three. They were 11 for 39 from three. So, yeah, they had 14 turnovers. You know, it just, their offense just got kind of gets like we stagnant at some points which they need to figure out uh brandon ingram didn't have a great shooting night as well he was only five for 17 you know 12 points he had shots when he needed to but overall just not a great shooting night from him so they need brandon ingram honestly brandon ingram hits a couple more shots they win this game but yeah and also interesting strategy from the thunder they were kind of leaving herb jones open and herb jones made him pay early but he didn't do much after he only was two for eight two for ten from three so that might be a strategy there. They're like, Herb Jones, you know what? You shot 44 7 from 3 in the regular season? Do it in this series. Do it. And he didn't do it last night, 2 for 8. You know, so I think that might be a little hidden thing that the Thunder are doing, letting Herb Jones take those shots and letting Herb Jones kind of run the offense or play offense, you know, is a big thing. Uh, but, yeah, they need the Pelicans need their threes. They need Bernie Ingram to do their thing. They need CJ to knock down the three. You know, he had a better game, but he still – wasn't super efficient, even though, well, no one really was efficient in this game. But I think this is going to be an interesting series. It's going to be interesting. 
you know? I think the Pelicans taking game one would have been huge. That would have been just a big, like, oh, man, AC taking the one, taking the first game, getting more confidence now. But I think if the Pelicans, you're still confident because you're like, dang, we had a bad shooting night. We had Bernie Ingram was 5 for 17. No one could hit a three on us. Herb Jones was 2 for 8. We had 14 turnovers, you know, but we only lost by two points. When we lost, we had CJ McCollum had a decent look that could have won us the game. So I think for the Pelicans, you're still confident. You're still like, you know, we 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 could get this. You know, for the Thunder, just got to be more efficient. You know, maybe just because it was the first playoff game for a lot of these guys, taking the rust off. But yeah, uh, this this is gonna be an interesting series. We guys gonna be here today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Very excited for this playoffs to keep going. Uh, once again, if you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing, like notifications to also like that i'd really appreciate it, it out a lot and uh, yeah i'll see you guys tomorrow